Real quick, I want us to go back to uh, verses 15. Shalem, the son of Kohosi, leader of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolt and bars, and repaired the wall of the pole of Shiloh by the king's guard as far as the stairs that go down to the city of David. So when you think of fountain, you think of water. And the fountain gate was strategically placed north of the dung or the water gate. Hence, you want the trash and everything else to flow this way. And the water from the Gehun Spring actually flowed into the city near the fountain gate. I mention all this to you because water pictures, water represents the Spirit of God. Water represents the quenching of us, that we are washed in the water, that we are washed in the Word of God. And so if you think back for a minute, just for a second, we went through the valley gate, and the valley gate looks at humility. Then we went to the dung gate, when a person is, is humble before God, and they come to examine themselves. What are the things that I need to get rid of? What are the things that defile me? And then we come to the fountain gate. And that looks as the fullness of God. I, wanna, I want to serve God with anything and everything that I am. And here in just a little bit, I'll have the next guest speaker. But I just want to get to these um, applications real quick. If you look at Nehemiah, verses 23, it says, After him, Benjamin and Hashab made repairs opposite of their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Hesaiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs by his house. So I mention that to you because in verse 23, verses 10, verses 28 to 30, and a couple others, what you will tend to notice is that these people, what broke their heart was the rebuilding of the wall, but they built the wall, these certain sections that was closest to their house. So the very first application I share with you all is be a missionary by serving your communities. You don't have to go out of this country to go serve somewhere. You can actually be a missionary in your own backyard. We have three different ministry opportunities here tonight. Second is, throughout the text, when you read chapter 3, you will notice that there are some people's names that are mentioned multiple times than others. And what that is, is that these people, when you read chapter 3, these people have chosen to work more than just on the section of the wall to go help others. And you will also read when you read chapter 3 that you will notice that some of these people just did their thing and just, I'm done. And it kind of reminds me of several years ago I was in an auto mechanic shop and I was talking to a woman. And a uh, woman was telling me about her church and so forth. And all of a sudden she says this. She says, um, yeah, I've done my time. And I looked at her and I said, well, what do you mean by that? She goes, well, you know, I did my time. I did 25 years uh, as a volunteer in a nursery. And I said, well, God bless you, man. Thank you for that. So how are you serving the Lord now? She goes, well, like I said, I did my time. I said, what are you doing now? She said, I just show up on Sunday mornings and listen to the pastor. I did my time. So my second application is this. Get busy as much as God enables you to do. Get busy as much as God enables you to do. And if you notice... In, in the passages that we've gone over, each person, even if you think back in chapter four, each person was there at the wall to fulfill a position, whether it was holding a spear or a sword or working on the wall, and they had a job to do. And that's the same thing as the church as it is today. We need to serve to bring glory to God and show the people the love of Jesus. Serve to bring the glory of God and show people the love of Jesus. And right now, I want to bring up our, our third guest speaker. And, and, and speaking of that, showing the love of Jesus, um, this next person is, is Hannah, and she is the area director for Next Step Ministries. And she, her involvement is with working with the flood victims that have been affected since June in Clinton. So, Jen, or, she, Jen, I said it. Hannah, will you please come on up? So similarly to Phil, I would not be able to do this without notes or we'd be here for a very long time. So um, I just wrote a few things down because I'm super passionate about the job that I get to do and um, I'm just really blessed to be able to do it. And so I um, just want to be able to share that well with y'all and thank you for allowing me to be here and it's a blessing to just be able to share um, with everyone here. So. Um, like Adam said, my name is Hannah. I am originally from 
Savannah, Georgia, um, and through the story you'll figure out how in the world I end up in Charleston, West Virginia. Um, but now I work for a nonprofit um, called Next Step Ministries, and at Next Step we are super passionate about doing short-term mission trips that can collide with long-term community development. Um, we have thousands of students that come through our kind of, we facilitate the mission trips, so um, they come through not physical doors, but they work through our ministry to go on mission trips around the country and a few internationally. Um, so five years ago, that's actually how I got involved. I was a student on a Next Step trip. I had just graduated high school, and I went and served um, at an H and, um, HIV and AIDS clinic in Nassau, Bahamas. And so while I was there, um, I didn't realize it then, but looking back on it, I really had this savior mentality about myself. I was a typical white suburban girl from Savannah, Georgia, and I was going to go fix everyone's life, and I was going to go serve. And at the end of the trip, um, I had taken a lot of pictures with kids that I had never known their name. I had worked really hard and felt strong and felt really good about myself, but at the end of the day, that's kind of all I had. Um, I hadn't made a real long-term difference there. A year later, I was hired on by Next Step to be in their summer staff. So instead of just serving for one week, I was placed in Braxton County, West Virginia. I had never been to West Virginia before. It wasn't my first pick. Um, and I was placed in Braxton County, served the entire summer there, doing rural relief. So we were in a very small town called Rosedale, if some of you guys have driven through there before. Um, and it was that year that Next Step as a whole kind of took a deeper look at how we were doing short-term mission trips. Um, in the past, we were doing things really student-based. So the students that come on our trips, are they having a good time? Are the, um, the projects that we do, are they really involved in them? And we were kind of leaving the communities behind in that. Um, and so about a year into me being with Next Step, we kind of realized that it, it wasn't worth doing great student trips at the community's expense. Um, and so with that, um, we started to hire people to live in the communities year-round. And so I was blessed to be hired by Next Step as a full-time employee, and I moved to Braxton County. Um, there, I was able to really see that individuals as a whole, um, which means families as a whole, which means communities as a whole, are very complex. There's a lot that goes into my messy life and my family's messy life. And, it, and consequently, the, the community's messy life. Um, we started looking into the poverty epidemic and why are things the way they are? Why do people get into these situations? Um, and realized that like the ramps and the roofs and the houses that we thought were the real thing were just kind of a band-aid to cover up the bigger problem. Um, whenever we look at poverty and do research, we realize that um, poverty has a lot more to do with the mental, um, you feel like you don't have any dignity or you feel like you don't have any hope. And so, um, for instance, I, I love this example. You know, you've heard the saying, you can give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. Um, you can teach a man to fish and he'll eat for the rest of his life. But whenever we look at poverty, we take it one step further and say, who owns the pond? And where is the lake? Because if you teach a man to fish, but he lives in the desert, then it doesn't really matter. And so kind of looking at this complex way of, um, a lot of people are hurting, but we don't want to give handouts. We want to do things in a really sustainable way. So looking at why people don't ac have access to things um, is a huge thing instead of, well, they put themselves in this position. In a lot of ways, um, it's because they don't have access to those resources, and so how can we come alongside of them and get those? Um, with this in mind, um, I, I just moved to Braxton, and it was such a blessing over the past two years I lived there, and started seeing people more 
for the assets that they already have instead of the needs that they have. To say that everyone can do something. I don't know what it is, but everyone has gifts. Everyone is passionate about something. And so instead of seeing people on the side of the road um, and saying, wow, they're just looking for a handout, they have a need to really come along people and see them for what they are, for what they're passionate about, and realize that everyone um, can have an impact. Everyone can come alongside of our neighborhood. And when you're looking in Nehemiah, to see that not everyone was super good at what they were doing, but everyone got involved, neighbor after neighbor after neighbor. Um, and so I was really blessed just to be in Braxton for really a short amount of time to say I was there for two years and to see community members come alongside me and pick out projects to say, I don't really need this, but my neighbor needs this a lot more. Um, and so we were able to do that together and see the community really rally together instead of us coming in with our bright-eyed and bushy-tailed kids and building a wheelchair ramp for someone and leaving. Um, the community was able to come alongside of our resources and build with us. Um, so all of that to say, we were in the middle of our of our summer this past year, um, we were working in Braxton County and the flood hit. Um, and so what I did, um, still looking back on it, the Lord was just working in crazy ways. Um, I never would have imagined um, how it would work out this way, but I left my neighbors in Braxton and I said, you guys keep going. It's kind of like, I don't have a child, but eventually you have to let them walk. You can't hold their hand forever. And so we had gotten them the resources they need. And I said, you guys keep going, keep doing this. I have to go help these people with the resources that I have also. Um, and so for about seven weeks during the summer, I was in Clinton and we worked alongside Samaritan's Purse. Um, we worked with the National Guard and with West Virginia BOAD and helped with the flood relief also. Um, so in October, our West Virginia site changed from a rural relief in Braxton County to now we're a flood disaster relief in Clinton in West Virginia. And um, in all of that, it's, it's just been, like I said, crazy that I never would have guessed that I would have been in West Virginia or that I would be so passionate about the people here, so passionate about what I get to do. Um, but in the same way, like until you do it, you don't really know. You've got to try. And so there's a huge opportunity for all of you to come and help the flood victims in Clinton. And Adam and I have been talking a lot over the past few months about how we could do that and the logistics of it all. And so for right now, um, we've come up with a date and it's a Saturday, March 18th, um, that your church will be able to volunteer in Clinton. And since I've moved here, I've actually become a disaster case manager also in Clinton. And so I have a lot of resources there and just kind of a network of people that can get us where the big need is. Um, and so on March 18th, you'll have the opportunity, if you would like, to come with us and volunteer. We might be doing drywall, we might be doing flooring, um, we might just be visiting with families and kind of restoring that dignity and hope um, and uplifting them in their situation. But if you're not construction savvy, please still come along. Like I was saying, a big part of it is just connecting with people. And so if you're excited about that, we can find a place for you to serve there also. Um, so in, in another way, um, if you're not super handy, if you don't feel comfortable going into Clinton, and then this is kind of our home base now here in Charleston in between here in Clinton and for Next Step Ministries. So this summer, we're going to have just about 600 volunteers that will come through this area. We'll have a staff similar to what I did for one summer that will come from all over the country to serve in West Virginia for 11 weeks. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, then um, like everyone else, I'll be in the back after this. And whether you sign up to serve on March 18th or you sign up to say, um, we would just like to support you this summer whenever the staff and your volunteers are here. We can help come make breakfast one day. That would be the biggest blessing. So whatever way you would like to serve, there's definitely opportunities. Um, and thank you for letting me be here tonight. As we, um, as we end tonight in this series of resolution. We understood, we understand that when Nehemiah heard the news, 
about the people being distraught and the city was in ruins and it reflected on God, it, it broke his heart. It broke his heart to the point, okay, what am I going to do now about this? Well, I'm going to get busy. And it was insane that Nehemiah's leadership was so inspirational. I said in the beginning that it got news all over Judea. We had people from perf uh, perfumers and goldsmiths and priests and Levites, you name it. All these people came to work. And so as we come to the end tonight, as we come to the end of this series, the question still remains, what breaks your heart? And if we think in general, what breaks our heart should be our communities. It should be our state. It should be our world. And so maybe what that looks like, maybe tonight you're, you're thinking about this. What breaks your heart? What can I do about it? Maybe it's one aspect of, of coming along with Union Mission and, and maybe helping with, you know, uh, the mentor ministry or just serving up at Brookside to see these women succeed back into society after they leave this program. Maybe what breaks your heart is the sanctity of life. I want to give my time. I want to either answer phones or work or, or maybe be trained as a counselor to help these women go through this season of life of not for them to abort their child. Or maybe your heart breaks in the possibility of you know somebody. Maybe you know someone who knows someone who has been in the flood. And you're like, yeah, what do I do? Well, Next Step Ministries, I mean, brother, if you want to put the boots to the ground and you want to go work on houses or you want to prepare meals, or if you can just be an ear to listen to someone because the normalcy of life has been completely rocked since June. So my prayer, and I've been praying this all day and all this week, that we wouldn't just take the series, we wouldn't just look a little bit, but we would be about God's business, that we would go and serve, that we would be about getting busy in some capacity. And so my encouragement to you guys tonight is that you would just have a conversation with them and ask them whatever you want to ask and see how you can get involved. Because here's the thing. As we end tonight, we have said this for four weeks. You may not be able to change the world, but you can change someone's world. And I pray that we as a church, as we as a body, as we get busy to serve our community, that we serve our church, that we serve our world. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that you sent your son to serve us. That it is your love that compels us, Lord, that your humility, your service, that, Father, that you bore yourself on the cross for us. That, Father, I, I pray tonight that for the rest of this week, that, Father, that we just contemplate, that we dwell, that we ponder on, that we chew on what breaks our heart. That, Father, that we would get busy to serve you, that we would please you you. Father, as we go about tonight, Father, I pray for the safety on the roads and that, Father, that we would